Hi, I'm Jessica Gibson from the Huron Historical Society and the Huron Public Library. Today is April 11, 2009, and I will be interviewing Steve Myers for the Huron Oral History Project. Hi, Steve. I'm Jessica. Can you tell me where you're from? I grew up in Huron. I was born in 1953, and I lived my entire you know, adolescent life up to the time I went in the Army on South Street in Huron. Okay. Uh, can you tell me about growing up on South Street? Uh, South Street was interesting. It was only a block and a half from the lake. The park was right around the corner, the lakefront park. Mm -hmm. And it was very short, and the park and the beach were a very short walk away. Did you also go to school in Huron? Yes. Okay. Graduating in 1972 from Huron High School. Okay. Can you tell me, do you have any special memories from school? Uh, or from childhood? Well, I remember my first, the first thing I remember in my life, the first thing I remember is playing in, the, playing in a uh, put, puddle of water after heavy rain out in front of our house on South Street. Did you do that often? Uh, yes. Yeah. Anything from school in particular? Uh, I remember wrestling, wrestling meets. Mm -hmm. I, was, uh, I was a wrestler in high school. That was my primary sport. I tried to play football, but wasn't too good at it. Mm -hmm. But I was better at wrestling. You enjoyed it? Yes. Oh, good. Um, now, can you tell me... Can you tell me a little bit about the docks? You or a lot, however much you know. I'm very curious about them. Okay. I don't know much myself. Okay. Growing up on South Street, I grew up on 308 South Street. And we were about halfway, halfway between the cove, the first cove on the west end of South Street, and the river on the east end of South Street. And you would hear the horns of the boats. You'd hear the whistles of the boats. And we'd always jump on our bicycles and run down to the river and see what boat was coming in. Can you describe for me um, what was going on on the docks or your memories of them? Did okay. you work on the docks? or? No, I did not work on the docks. Okay. It was 73 and I went in the Army after high school. Okay. Uh, but uh, at the end of South Street, you could look up on the ore dock and you could see the two Hewlett unloaders working on a boat. Could you describe for me um, exactly what those are and the what, they, what they do? They're Hewlett ore unloaders. Okay. They uh, basically an arm that rotates back and forth. It could reach down into the boat with a bucket, pull out the ore, come back, dump it. Reach down, come back, dump it. Can you tell me what they used before that, before the um, unloaders? Uh, at that particular dock, they used what were called fast plants. It was just a uh, clamshell bucket that came out on a, on a uh, column and would reach down in the boat, much similar to the Hewlett's, but not as efficiently the, you know, the whoosh. Okay. The, Did they take longer? Uh, probably slightly longer, but the Hewlett's they built, the first Hewlett's they built in 1914 in Huron. They were much more efficient than the fast plants. All of the fast plants continued to work okay. until 1950, and the, the last Hewlett's were erected. Is there anything else you can share about the docks? I remember uh, down at the end of the pier at the coal dock, which is where the lime plant is now. The coal docks, they would push coal cars up into the dumper, and the loaded car would push out the empty car. The empty car would roll down the kickback track, they called it a kickback track, through a spring switch and up the hill. And usually among my friends we'd bet and see which one would make it all the way to the top of the hill or even over the hill. I don't suppose, I suppose it happened, but we never saw it. And it would coast to the top of the hill, change direction, coast back through the switch into the, receive, into the empty yard. So that's kind of neat. Yeah, and then the, uh, the loaded car would be lifted up, turned over, would dump it into the boat, and you'd hear that whoosh of the uh, coal going in. Of 
course, growing up on South Street, you'd hear you'd hear the sh of the co of the coal dumper. You would hear the banging and clanging of the uh, Hewlett unloaders. Mm -hmm. They were controlled by cables. They lifted up and down by cables. So at the bottom of their cycle, the cables would be slack. When they started coming up, the cables would kind of slam and would bang and ring, and they'd take up the slack and then pull the thing back up again. You could hear the cables banging, but that was the noise growing up on South Street. Not much sleep then? No. Well, that was music. I'd oh. love to go by. I'd love to hear that again. So was that one of your favorite things, definitely, that you remember? Well, at the time, I never thought of it as a favorite thing. It does. Okay. It is now. Okay. Now, earlier, uh, you had mentioned the Wheeling and Lake Erie Railroad. Can you tell me about that? Okay. The Wheeling and Lake Erie Railroad was formed in 1871 okay. and was first built in 1877 as a narrow gauge line between Norwalk and Huron. It was only a three-foot narrow-gauge railroad, one of only a few in Ohio. It operated for about two years and finally went, went broke. Since it did, you know, being narrow-gauge, it couldn't connect to the railroad system at large, and it couldn't generate business. So it closed in a couple, couple years later, 1879 or so. In 1880, uh, Jay Gould, who was a railroad uh, financier, bought an interest in the Wheeling and Lake Erie and wanted to build it connect with another railroad he owned in the Pittsburgh area. And so at that time, the uh, Wheeling and Lake Erie was converted to standard gauge, the current gauge, which is four feet, eight and a half inches between the rails. And at that point, uh, you know, the Wheeling and Lake Erie wanted to build the Sandusky and just passed through here on. But uh, they asked for money from the, both Sandusky and Huron, you know, some front money to build their, build their docks there. Sandusky refused to pay the money. Huron did pay the money. So the dock was established in Huron. And the first o load of iron ore in Huron was unloaded in 1882. So that's when it really became a big um, No, big actually, it, it wasn't really that big. It was, uh, there were certain limitations. For one, uh, the Wheeling Lake Erie they still had no outlet, so that what they had trouble getting cars. At first, they un just un unloaded ore, but they had to get the empty cars to Huron, which was a problem. Because once they loaded the cars, they were gone from Huron, they had no more to load. It was at that time they decided they would dump coal. They would load coal as a way to get cars full of coal to Huron. They would unload them and then have a ready supply of empty cars to take back down. And that became even more possible when the Wheeling had reached down to the Wheeling, West Virginia area and could serve the mines in, the, in southeast Ohio. So it's very interesting. It went down that far? Yeah. Wow. It went to, it came down just across from Wheeling, West Virginia. It didn't actually go into Wheeling, West Virginia, but uh, was right across the river from it, Ohio River. Okay. It also connected with uh, Gould's, what they called at the time, Wabash Pittsburgh Terminal Railroad. It's now, it became the Pittsburgh and West Virginia Railroad. Mm hmm. Can you tell me then about the, these are the trains that have passed through uh, Huron. Do you know anything else about uh, the trains that go through Huron or have gone through, excuse me, in the past? Okay, the other track through Huron is, uh, was started what they called the Junction Railroad. It only went as far as Cleveland to Sandusky. Uh, they took a shortcut to Fremont where they would cross the Sandusky River and then come back to Toledo on the original main line. Then they built the built the bridge across Sandusky Bay, and that became a through route between Cleveland and Toledo. Okay. And it gradually, the traffic gradually grew and grew, and that became the part of the great New York Central System, reaching all the way from New York City to Chicago. Wow, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. And uh, one time there were four tracks through Huron on that main line, uh, starting by the, 
by the end of the 1950s, they'd reduced it to two tracks. But there were still a lot of passenger trains coming through, fast passenger trains and freight trains, many, many freight trains. And there's nothing like that, nothing quite as large going through There's anymore. only a couple of passenger trains now. All the freight traffic is still pretty impressive through here. Um, can I um, kind of go back a little bit and um, ask you, where were your parents from? Uh, my father's named Albert Myers. He grew up in uh, rural Huron County near Bellevue. Uh, he, uh, no, he grew up a farmer's son, so he... Uh, you know, he did what farmers' sons do, work the farm as well as hunt and fish. And, uh, but uh, a, skill he had got, a skill he had gained was, to, uh, was slaughtering cattle, becoming a butcher. And he would kind of just do that for the family and for people who wanted him to do it. And, and he ended up getting a job at uh, what used to be called Waldock Packing Company in Sandusky, you know, a high production uh, meat packing company. It was there he met my mother. My mother's name was Catherine Marnello, who grew up as a daughter of an Italian immigrant in Sandusky, Ohio, right, along Perkin, right on Perkins Avenue. And uh, he met my mother working at Waldock. They were both working at Waldock. Um, is that how they came to live in uh, Huron? Well, my father had gotten a part-time job at a new meat market on Main Street called Hart's Meat Market. And uh, the part-time job evolved into a full-time job. And uh, when my father married my mother, they moved to Huron. Now, um, you mentioned that you had graduated in 52? 1972. 72, sorry. Um, can you tell me about urban renewal? I remember that... Uh, when we started our freshman year in high school, the town was pretty well intact. You know, pra practically all the buildings, there were maybe a few small buildings that had been torn down. But by the end of my high school days, practically the whole town was, had been destroyed. And what did you think about that? I supported it at the time. Uh, the buildings were decrepit. Uh, I remember my father working at the meat market. Of course, he rent, you know, he became manager of the meat market after the owner at that time had died, had died unexpectedly. He became the manager of the market. But uh, he had to rent the building. And he uh, complained quite a bit of how, of the condition of the building. And I believe, you know, to this day, I believe that uh, if any one of those buildings had caught fire, the old buildings had caught fire, they could have lost the whole downtown in one, in one, at one time, because they were fire traps. Okay. So you like, do you like um, what they've done? Uh, they've done a good job with, uh, in hindsight, I wish they had, uh, I wish they had either not done it or else uh, made a hybrid, you know, tore down, tore down the worst buildings, but kept some of the better ones. Uh, do you have a favorite part um, of the urban renewal, like a favorite area? Now or then? Um, now. And then you can tell me then as well, well the, like before. Uh, the boat basin has turned out to be a nice little park. I like to hang out there during the River Fest. Okay. You know, it makes a nice convenient place with the amphitheater. They've done a good job there in the, in the harbor master's office. But it, uh, it, just doesn't, it just doesn't equal the old town. The old town had a lot of soul. I think by tearing that downtown mm -hmm. down, Huron lost a lot of soul. Do you see, uh, what do you see in Huron's future? Is there anything that you'd like to see happen? Uh, Personally, I would like to see the street grid of the old downtown restored as much as possible. I've been of the opinion they should reconnect Main Street. Main Street now jogs around the uh, one building and then jogs out on Cleveland Road. I'm of the opinion they should reconnect Main Street, almost a mirror image of the way it is now. 
and reconnect the North, you know, North Main Street. The buildings on North Main Street, most of them are empty. Uh, there's a lot of potential there. I remember the showboat at the end of the end of Main Street and the Twine House were busy places. And they were busy because Main Street still connected to them. That you could drive into town, drive through downtown, drive to the end of the street, and you had uh, two very fine restaurants. So Once, you'd like to see that that restoration, at least a little bit of, of downtown. I would like to see the grid restored as much okay. as possible. All right. Especially Main Street. They should reconnect Main Street. Okay. I believe that's all I have for you. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with me? Any any stories? Uh, well, growing up in Huron, we I had kind of a mixed. Since my father was a butcher and raised cattle, we did a lot of things in the country, but we also lived in a in the town, and uh, I had rich background, very rich background. To the best of all worlds. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I remember occasionally, uh, occasionally my father would bring the loaded cattle truck into town, you know, to go home and get something to eat. And of course, all the neighborhood kids would uh, come in and try to look at the cattle. They like them. Try to feed the cattle. And, oh. <laughs> well, that's. I find it very interesting that your father was a butcher. Mm -hmm. Did you at all help? That business, oh, yeah. or oh yeah, by the time the market closed in 1966, and I had started work doing a little bit of work at the market, mostly sweeping the floor. My all my brothers worked at the market, especially my older brother Mark. My two two younger brothers Tom and Charlie have taken over the. Our slaughterhouse was on Bogart Road, and uh, they have since, they continue to operate the business there as a custom butchering. So both my brothers, Charlie and Tom, became, were, became butchers and operate the slaughterhouse now, pretty much as it was, as it's always been. I worked at the slaughterhouse for many years. My mother liked to say that I worked there probably longer than Tom and Charlie. Is it something that you miss doing? Uh, it had its good things, but uh, I work in transportation. I've always been a train nut, so. Okay. But I work with trains now. Uh, although most of, much of our freight, most of our freight goes through on a line south of here. Occasionally, one of our boxes go through here on container trains, and I manage container traffic. Okay. Can you tell me what a container train is? Okay, these are, uh, this has been the evolution of rail freight. It's basically 48 or 53 foot containers, hard boxes, that are loaded two on a flat car. And we get these long trains going through here loaded with double stack container traffic. Oh, okay, I believe I've seen those. I just didn't realize they were called that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they're domestic containers. They also have ocean containers come through here. You'll see uh, foreign ocean containers, also double stacked. Occasionally, you'll see uh, trailers on wheels carried on flat cars. Okay. But that's becoming uh, that's becoming obsolete. It's all containers now. The boxes can be lifted off the train, put on truck wheels, delivered to the customer. They come back with other freight, put back on the freight, put back on the flat car, move to an, you know move to the west coast, and start the cycle starts again. Oh. It's literally, uh, it's literally re remade rail traffic. In right. high school, you know, railroads were going bankrupt and uh, falling apart. Well, I'd hate to interrupt. Um, if you'd like to continue, yeah. that would be wonderful. But um, if you don't mind, um, we need to pause for a moment. Okay. Do you mind um, continuing your discussion of the trains? The line going through here now is uh, Norfolk Southern. Interestingly enough, uh, Norfolk Southern also became the successor to the Wheeling and Lake Erie slash nickel plate docks. So the only railroad in town is now Norfolk Southern. 
Norfolk Southern uh, gained, this, gained the high speed line through town as part of the Conrail breakup. There's a lot of discussion about uh, corporate bailouts right now and stuff. The, uh, the federal government actually bailed out the Penn Central Railroad back in 19, well, it started in 74, finally took effect in 76. The government actually took over Penn Central and several other bankrupt railroads, combined them into Conrail. At, uh, by deregulating rail, rail traffic, which were heavily regulated for many years, they deregulated rail traffic and that enabled the railroad companies to offer services, offer services to their benefit freely and to reduce their uh, physical plant, abandoning tracks, combining tracks. And starting in the late 1980s and early 90s, the railroads took off. Now they're a uh, very, very progressive and uh, thriving industry. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Okay. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share at this time? Uh, you were asking about memories before. Okay. Good. Another thing I miss is uh, behind the slaughterhouse on Bogart Road, my brothers now operate. The land around it is now farmed, but in uh, for many years it was just pasture, and it was always fun to uh, it was always fun to drive the cattle back up to the you know try to gather up the cattle from the pasture field and drive them back up to the uh, slaughterhouse. Or occasionally I would, uh, I like to swim in the stock tank. <laughs> you know, just a big uh, tub of, you know, just a big tub of water, but it was, you know. And of course, splashing around, the cattle will always come up to investigate. So usually here I am splashing around in the stock tank <laughs> with, the, <laughs> with the cattle, uh, checking it out. And of course, we would pick sweet corn, and we would uh, husk the sweet corn and throw it into the field, and the cattle would cattle would love that. They'd come up and eat eat every bit of it. I miss that. I keep telling my brothers, you know, when are you going to start raise, grazing cattle here again? Of course, they won't do it. I don't think it can be done anymore. At the time, my father was there as the city limits uh, stopped stopped nearby. So they've expanded the city, kind of drawn it outward. Since the city has, you know, added more land, it's not the slaughterhouse is now within the city. Okay. Um, you said the land was farmed now. The f land is farm, yeah. Okay, but before it was um, before pasture. it was just pasture, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Steve. Really okay. appreciated um, your stories and your memories.